Dude, why don't you do some medical testing? Some of them can pay actually pretty good. My best friend Harold said to me one day, I had just been complaining about how expensive my most recent car repairs are going to be. Being the friend who always holds up the light and hands tools to whoever is actually working on the car, and never actually trusting myself to do any of the work had finally caught up with me, and at the shop with my Honda which was currently charging me $800. Don't you have to be, like, healthy to do that? I had asked. I remembered scrolling through Craigslist ads looking for anybody desperate enough to post a gig on there and hopefully make some quick cash. I was almost to the point of writing a high schooler's English paper for 20 bucks. Nah, man. They have tests going on for everything. Some for smokers. Harold coughed after hitting the joint we were passing between each other. Some for non-smokers, health nuts, couch potatoes, you name it, man, and there's something out there they can test you for. After another coughing fit, he handed me the rapidly burning joint. And they don't drug test or anything? Some do. If you fit specific criteria, there are some that pay big bucks. He said as I hit the joint. I coughed before responding to him. This was some really strong stuff. And how are you suddenly the vast wall of knowledge on medical testing? He smiled. How do you think I'm suddenly able to buy this dank weed? He was right. Harold was the type of person to buy the cheapest stuff imaginable, but in the last month his taste had gotten better. I thought about it for a second and I realized that I hadn't complained about his lack of money for the past couple of months. Since our senior year of high school, he had always needed help buying concert tickets, buying his waiter, paying his water bill. Basically anything that cost more than 20 bucks he needed help with. But he wasn't now. Hell, he had bought the weed we were smoking by himself. And judging by the strength of my current high, it was some damn good stuff. What the hell, I thought. There were worse things I could do for money. Harold drove me down to the nondescript medical building on the edge of the city, and he parked in the three-story concrete parking structure next to it. Are you sure I'll find something? Without the high from last night calming me, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to get my car fixed before the pizza place I delivered for it hired somebody else to replace me. No worries, man. They're doing a lot of stuff in there. And besides, I get a bonus if I refer somebody that gets picked. He gave a big smile towards me. If there is anything I could trust in this world, it would be Harold finding his consistent weed habit. If you think so, I said. We both stepped out of the car, took the elevator down to the first floor, and we walked to the entrance of the cream-colored building. It was much nicer inside than it had looked outside. A large sheer white bottom floor with lots of open space and a seating area with eight comfy looking chairs next to the receptionist desk. A young woman sat behind it in a headset, speaking into the small microphone hanging in the front of her mouth. Harold walked straight up to the front desk and smiled at the receptionist. Before he could speak, she lifted her finger up in the universal sign of, one second please, without moving her eyes from the computer screen behind her desk. Of course, Dr. Brown, I'll let them know right away. And she reached behind the desk and then looked up. Uh, sorry about that. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Harold. Oh, hey, Steph. She sighed. Harold, I have told you two times before. I'm not, a I'm not here to ask you out again, I promise. I'm here to bring a referral. He pointed his thumb behind him at me. I smiled and I waved my hand. I could see why Harold had tried to ask her out. She was pretty damn cute. Her frown turned into a small upturned smile. Oh, of course. Uh, can I get your name, please? I walked up to the desk and I looked at her politely. Uh, Richard Pinsky. She typed for a second before saying anything. I'm just going to print some forms for you here that you're going to need to fill out. She stopped typing and reached under the desk. I caught Harold sneaking a peek at the brief flash of her cleavage before she leaned back up with a small stack of papers and a clipboard. Here you go, Richard. Harold, why don't you go sit with him and help him fill them out? Stephanie glared at him, her dissatisfaction towards his previous advances plain as day on her face. She clipped the papers to the clipboard and pointed as politely as one could to the seating area. We both sat and looked at the front pages. The first couple of pages were the usual thing you would expect at any doctor's office. Weight, age, list of bad and good habits, a list of allergies, 
There is none. Medications. And nothing also. And of course, the questions that I dreaded filling in on any doctor's form. Family history. This always got awkward because, while I wasn't diagnosed with anything, there was always the slight possibility my genetics could suddenly kick in. Half of my mom's side of the family had schizophrenia or depression, and my dad's side of the family is ridiculously prone to cancer and diabetes. I wasn't even comfortable talking to Harrow about this type of stuff, especially the schizophrenia. I took a second before looking at the list and checking off family history. I really needed this money. I needed my car fixed and I needed to get back to work as soon as possible, if I was going to pay rent on time. I sighed and I checked off diabetes and several different types of cancer that my extended family had over the years. I made sure to not check off depression, bipolar, or schizophrenia. No need to worry, man. Cancer and diabetes are pretty common things. I'm sure it won't hurt your chances too bad. Harold said. He was leaning in his seat and looking at the clipboard on my lap. You're making this uncomfortable, man. I'm having enough trouble filling this shit out as it is. Could you not look so eager for the referral bonus? I said. Sorry, I just thought I could help out. He leaned back into his seat and he took his phone out of his pocket. I turned the page over and I looked at the next one. What is this shit? It was a couple giant blocks of dense text and it was such a small print I could barely make it out. And the easiest thing was the title of the page at the top. Medical Authorization Agreement. Hey, Harold. He turned from his phone and he looked at me. I thought you didn't want my help, man. Stop being a smartass and tell me what the hell this is. He looked at the paper for a full half second before laughing. Oh, that's just the authorization to perform medical exams, man. Most of it's just legalized. It basically says that they can examine you, take blood samples, shit like that. It makes sense. I found the bottom of the document where my name was printed on. I signed and dated the signature line like the piece of paper told me. The next line was a similar dense block of text that I could barely make out. This one had a non-disclosure agreement on the top of it. This one, I interrupted Harold. I know what an NDA is, Harold. I signed the NDA, which turned out to be the last page. And I got up to give the clipboard back to the receptionist. No need. I'll inform the doctor that you're ready to go up. I sat back down and didn't know what to do while I waited. So I pulled my phone out and I tried to pull up some information on the company. According to their website, Dynamic Medical Machines was one of the leading companies in biomedical device design. Before I could click on any of the links, I heard a loud ding and I looked up. The elevator closest to us opened and an older woman in a white lab coat stepped out. She looked in our direction and gave us a wide smile. Good afternoon, Harold. Steph told me you were here with your friend. I turned and I looked at him. He smiled back. You, uh, came up in conversation. The woman arrived where we were sitting and extended her hand. I'm Dr. Brown. I'm the head of development here at DMM. I shook it. Rick, I deliver pizza. She laughed. For such a serious looking woman, she had a warm laugh. And no need to tell us what you do. Everybody who comes through the screening process isn't here because they're successful. Harold could probably see the worried look on my face. You'll be fine, Rick. I'll be down here waiting. If you could take the elevator with me upstairs, we can get your screening process started. And Dr. Brown moved aside to show the open elevator she had come through. Good luck, man. Harold said as the two of us walked towards the elevator. When both of us were inside, the doctor pulled out a badge from her pocket and waved it in front of a scanner. That was situated just under the buttons on the elevator. When the little red light on it turned green, she pressed the three and the doors closed. I tried to hand the clipboard to her, but she waved her hand. I don't handle paperwork. Somebody will be up there to handle it. She had a serious look on her face again, and stood in silence as the elevator took its goddamn time getting up two floors. I tried to defuse the awkward silence. So, what do you do here? She didn't remove her gaze from the door. I can't answer any of your questions before you go through intake. Intake? Processing? Either this company was a legitimate medical company or it was a slaughterhouse.
The doors opened on another receptionist and another clean white room with a clean white desk. This room was much smaller, about the normal size for a doctor's office. The doctor waved her hand towards the receptionist's desk and I walked to it. Richard, the receptionist said. I handed her the clipboard and examined each paper with a careful eye. Everything looks in order. You can go ahead and take him back, doctor. I heard a loud buzz and the only door in the room clicked open. The doctor was already next to it and ushered me through. Uh, can you tell me? I tried to ask, but Dr. Brown interrupted me. You'll be taken through processing and testing before I can say anything. Please go in this room, sit down in the examination chair, and wait for the phlebotomist. Once all of the testing is done, we can speak more. She said, opening an unmarked door that opened onto a typical looking examination room with an examination chair covered in paper. When I sat down in the chair, the doctor closed the door behind me and the test began. A man in nurse's scrubs appeared a couple of minutes later with pre sealed syringes and took three vials of blood. He was nice but didn't offer much in the way of conversation. After he was done, he handed me a cup and moved me to the bathroom for a urine test. A drug test? The phlebotomist answered. Yeah, but don't worry, it's just for compatibility. Compatibility? He sighed. I shouldn't have said anything. Once you're done, I'll leave the sample on top of the toilet in the marked container and return to the examination room. He closed the door behind me and I stared. Even the bathroom was a sheer right just like the rest of the rooms he had been in so far. I don't know how they kept it as clean as they did. So I peed in the cup and I left it in the marked basket on top of the toilet. I opened the door and I went back into the examination room. Or I tried, as the doorway was mostly blocked by a large machine on a cart. Oh, sorry, let me get that. A small Asian man came from the side and pulled the cart out of the doorway allowing me to get back into the examination room. As I sat down in the chair, I saw what he had been doing just out of view. He was taking what looked like a swimming cap with a bunch of electrodes on it and plugging wires that ran from the machine. He saw me staring at the machine in the swimming cap with wires coming out of it and laughed. Oh, sorry, I'm Dr. Zhao. The cap here is going to read the electrical signals coming from your brain as you answer some questions for me. Like a lie detector? I had asked. A little more complicated than a lie detector, but yes. Now if you could. He held the now fully connected cap in front of him. I sighed and I pulled the damn thing on my head. I was glad at this point that I kept my hair short. I had no idea how Harold fit the snug rubber cap on his beautiful mane of hippie hair. After the cap was firmly on my head, Dr. Zhao flipped a couple of switches on the machine and moved the screen towards him so I could no longer see it. Now, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I need you to answer them as truthfully as you can. You got it? I guess. Uh, can I ask why? Uh, not unless you want to violate the NDA you signed. Now. He pulled a clipboard from the cart. Now, please state your full name. Richard Pinsky. I didn't hear a sound or anything, besides a small persistent hum from a large piece of machinery on the cart. Dr. Zhao stared at the screen for a second before turning back to the clipboard. All right, do you love your parents? That was a weird question. I guess. Screen again, and then the clipboard. Do you find children sexually attractive? What the fuck kind of question is that? What are any of these questions? I'm done. I reached towards my head to take out the cap, but I felt a smooth hand on mine before I could. Look, I know how weird these sound, but we need to weed out any undesirable people in our trials. You can imagine why we don't want to have any child molesters in our medical trial, right? I thought about it. I guess that made sense if you thought about it in a certain way. Now, do you find children sexually attractive? He asked again. I sighed. No. He looked at the screen again. Good. Now, if a train leaves a station in Los Angeles traveling east at 50 miles an hour, and another train leaves another station in Williamsburg traveling 60 miles an hour traveling west, how long will they be on a collision course before the heat death of the universe happens? 
Um, what? And I asked. How the hell was I even supposed to answer that question? It was more like a word salad than any kind of comprehensible question that could be answered. Dr. Zhao looked at the screen again. Okay, I got what I need. He set the clipboard on the cart and pulled the cap out of my head. That's it? I got what I needed. Dr. Brown should be back with you shortly. He said. It was all almost comical how fast he opened the door and pulled a large machine and cart out of it. He didn't even bother to unplug the hat from the machine when he had taken such care to plug it in. Dr. Brown came in about 10 minutes later. Her serious face was gone and she had a wide smile on her face. Mr. Pinkney, I just spoke with Dr. Zhao and saw the results of your test. And it looks like we have what we need. I sat confused. What you need? Your mind, more specifically, your brain. You have the type we are looking for for our newest implant trials. That was good, I guess. But wait a minute. Implant? She sighed. The trial does involve some surgery, yes, but you will be well compensated for it. Our usual package involves an initial payment of $4,000 for the surgery, and $1,500 a month as long as you are in trial. $4,000? And this was too good to be true. Not only could I get my car fixed, I wouldn't even need to work for as long as the trial was going on. Is Harold part of this trial? He is. But please don't speak about the trial to him as it violates the NDA. I get it. I interrupted her. She had interrupted me so many times about the NDA and not answering me that she deserved at least one. She laughed. Yes, yes, I probably deserve that. But please listen to me. We are developing a device that will hopefully be able to transfer thoughts between two different people. We are calling it Project Telepathy. This sounded insane. A mysterious medical company that was going to pay me to put a device in my head that could transfer thoughts. But on the other hand, it was $4,000. With that kind of money, I could even pay my credit card bills down. Crazy medical company. $4,000. When would I get paid? Her face was serious when she answered. No hint of a smile on her face. As soon as you sign the papers, authorizing the surgery... I thought about it for another minute. My brother's birthday was coming up, and I hadn't been able to get him anything for the last couple of years. And plus, the credit card companies had sent multiple letters asking for their payments. Where do I sign up? I said finally. I mean, what could go wrong? It turns out, a lot. Some more paperwork signed and a trip to the bank to make sure they checked the game you didn't bounce on. I was suddenly $4,000 richer. Holy shit. I said to myself when I checked the account balance on my phone for the third time since getting home. I told you it was legit, man. Harold shied at me while I sat on the couch staring at my phone. He took a puff of the joint he'd lit after we'd sat down. It was obvious now. Between the immaculate interiors of the building and the $4,000 check... They were legit. Of course, being legit meant they were actually going to implant something in my head, though. You're in the telepathy project, too. In response, Harold tapped the back of his head between his skull and neck. No need to worry, man. It's not actually brain surgery. The thing's about the size of a quarter with a couple of tiny wires. They install it just under the cerebellum. Cerebellum? When did the high school dropout learn anything? Harold's smile faltered for a second. He smiled again before and went into the realm of annoyance. Hey, I guess I actually paid attention for once. And that little falter was odd for Harold. But now that he wasn't broke all the time, maybe he finally had some self-esteem and wouldn't take the friendly put-downs as much. Or maybe I was just being too much of a hassle. Either way, I shrugged off the odd look he had given me for half a second. Looking back on it now... I should have seen that as the first sign of something being wrong. But I'm an idiot sometimes, and I choose to forget about it. Our conversation didn't go much of anywhere, and after another hour or two, Harold left me and had about a gram of the excellent weed that he had brought with him. It was 4 o'clock. I was tired from going through all the testing and having to wake up at 7am, but it was much too late to take a nap. 
The car shop was glad to hear that they could finally start working on my car. My backed up cell phone bill got paid and I made my first payment on my credit card in nearly six months. And the night was pretty uneventful. And besides catching up on episodes of the latest Marvel Netflix TV show, I tried to catch a couple of Z's but was really woken up by a phone call at 7am. Hello? I said groggily. Hello, Mr. Pinksky. I'm calling from Dynamic Medical Machines. I sat up, suddenly feeling awake despite the five hours of sleep I had gotten. Oh, hi. Uh, what's up? I'm calling to schedule your surgery. That's quick. You guys don't waste time. And the person on the other side of the phone laughed. Time is money, Richard. We are a company that makes profit. We have a spot later in the week and one for later in the afternoon a day if you're not busy. Today? Why would they want to do it so quickly? And the answer came to me almost as soon as I asked it. And they didn't have anybody else to study. They found something rare that they needed and they didn't want to waste time when they finally had the thing they needed. It was nice to feel valuable for once in my life. Uh, Mr. Pinksky, are you there? Uh, yeah, sorry. How long will the surgery be? We can't guarantee the recovery time, but it's usually an hour or two before you can go home. The implant doesn't require a general anesthesia, and it doesn't go deep, so it's installed in just a couple of stitches and some mild painkillers. The nice person on the other end said, Oh, how's later today then? I'll come by around 6 to pick you up at that school. Harold said as I stepped out of the passenger side door. Sounds good. I closed the door and I watched the eternal stone wave as he drove off. Here again after a single day willing to get an implant in my head. This was either the beginning of a superhero origin story or a horror movie. I didn't quite know which yet. I stepped into the front lobby and went directly up to the desk. Stephanie was at the front desk again. Hey there, Mr. Pinsky. Big day today, huh? She said before pressing a button on her phone. I'll make sure I let Dr. Brown know you're here. No worries. I said before I went to go sit down in one of the chairs. Oh, there's no need for that, Rick. I turned to the elevator that was closest to the waiting seats to find Dr. Brown standing there. It was the one on the opposite side from the one we had taken yesterday. Dang, that was quick. I said before stepping into the elevator. Any particular reason we're taking this one instead of the other one we took yesterday? And Dr. Brown took her badge and waved in front of the scanner. It beeped and turned from a glowing red to a green before she pressed the B button on the floor level. And this is the only one that goes to the basement level where the operating theater is. She said and I looked at her, suddenly worried about what I had signed up for. She looked at my face and gave me the warm smile that I'd enjoyed yesterday. Okay, I know how horror movie it all sounds. We're a medical company that implants devices in the basement of our faceless corporate building. I can guarantee that we are no such thing. The basement is fully staffed with the best medical equipment and personnel in the entire city. Three recovery rooms, two surgeons and four nurses. The food comes directly from the company cafeteria upstairs so even the food will be better than the hospital. The doors opened as she finished her rant. I opened my eyes. There was a blinding light preventing me from seeing anything and the pain forced me to shut them again. What the hell is going on? I was just in the... I trailed off. Where the hell was I just... Stuff was fuzzy and the back of my neck hurt. Mr. Pinsky, I'm glad to see you're awake. How are you feeling? I recognized the voice as Dr. Brown. I had a horrible headache. I have a headache. A voice from a nearby speaker somewhere said in a robotic voice. What the hell? What the hell? And the robot voice said again. I see the implant is working. I tried not to think about what I was going to say before saying it. I didn't feel like hearing my own thoughts coming out again and again from a computer speaker somewhere. Why can't I remember anything? There are some complications, Dr. Brown said. I couldn't see it, but I could imagine the word look on her face. There was some feedback from the implant after we connected it to your cerebellum, and you had lost consciousness. 
The surgeons and doctors were able to prevent any damage, but some memory loss is to be expected. I tried to open my eyes again. They had adjusted a bit more and I was able to make out the hospital room that I was laying in. And Dr. Brown sat in a chair next to my bed looking like she had made herself comfy hours ago. What time is it? I asked. I blinked a couple of times to try and make my eyes adjust to the light faster. She laughed a bit. I can see you're still a bit disoriented. All normal, I promise. And it's 15 past 7. I looked frantically from one side of the bed to the other, looking for my phone. Harold was probably still out in the waiting room looking for me. Harold was informed of your state and sends his regards. She took something from her pocket and handed it in my direction. It was a phone. My phone. I clicked the screen open as soon as it was in my hands and I saw a get some rest text from Harold on my opening screen. How long until I get out of here? I asked her. Dr. Brown took a clipboard that had been attached to the front of the bed and looked at it. Everything is looking okay according to toxology, but we want to keep you in overnight for observation. This is fucking annoying. The speaker said again. I looked around to find the speaker was on the card in the corner of the room. It had the same machine that Dr. Zhao had used but without a cap attached to it. Dr. Brown laughed again. I understand. There of course will be no charge for your care. And I've also been authorized to give you a small bonus for your trouble. If you wanna, check to your account. I did. There's a thousand extra dollars since the last time that I checked it. A little less annoying. The speaker came out again. Can we turn that damn thing off? I asked the doctor. Oh, of course. She got up from her seat and turned off the machine. I hadn't noticed the hum that the machine had been making until it was off and the room became blissfully quiet. Now, I have some other things to take care of. The nurses are on call, stationed 24-7 right outside of your room. And dinner's at 9. Nice if you excuse me. Without any further explanation, she walked out of the room in a hurry. And now that Dr. Brown wasn't there to distract me, I noticed the itching on the back of my neck. I tried to feel where it was coming from, but pulled back when a small flare of pain erupted as I made contact with it. I was in the basement of a medical building in the middle of downtown. The complications from the surgery required me to stay inside and I had an implant that broadcasted my thoughts to a machine that was in my room. Wait a minute. The implant was working. I had heard the machine broadcast my own thoughts. But the machine was on when I woke up. It was on when I wasn't awake. Why would it be on when I wasn't? The nurses were pretty quiet. They wouldn't even tell me their names, much less answer any questions about the machine or the implant. Either they had signed NDAs as well, or they really didn't know anything. I was personally leaning more towards the latter. But of course, I was the idiot who volunteered to get a mysterious device implanted in my neck, so what the hell do I know? I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I pulled up the website for dynamic medical machines. I probably should have done it a couple days ago, but hey... I thought that I could excuse myself, considering the surgery and the subsequent blackout. It was pretty typical corporate stuff, forming the future of medical implants and leading medical technology into the future, and all of the vague nonsense that a corporation puts on their website when they don't want you to know exactly what they do. And they however did have a page with the heads of the company, and of course there is a picture of a stern woman with an oddly warm smile named Dr. Isabel Brown. And because there was nothing else to do, I looked up Dr. Brown some more. She was famous in her field. Her alma mater mentioned her name in a review of the most well-known alumni at her school. A couple of patents in her name, too. And she seemed to be the top-of-the-line doctor that she described everybody else as being inside this building. On the third page of the Google searches for her name, an old article popped up, though. From an archived copy of 14 Times from 1979... Her being 15 was not the focus of the article. What was the focus of the article was her father, Dr. Patrick Brown. He was famous in his own right too. The article was describing the testing center he ran. Dr. Patrick Brown was convinced that there were psychics in the world. Real people that he could find to prove his belief that there was something more in this world. 
Something great and unknown that we could experience but never fully understand. Someone that could know the shape of what card you picked without actually seeing anything. The center itself was still open according to Google, although there wasn't any mention of Dr. Patrick Brown on their website. Before I knew it, it was morning, and there was a knock on my open door. How are you doing this morning, Mr. Pinsky? Dr. Brown said from the doorway. I yawned. I couldn't sleep much. To be expected since you woke up at 6pm yesterday. Is there any itching or soreness? A bit. Whatever the nurses gave me though helped out a lot, I had said. And there was in fact a bit of soreness, but painkillers are a hell of a drug. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Are you feeling for some testing of the implant? She asked. I noticed that she had a clipboard in her hand. Of course she didn't care about how I felt. She just wanted to test if her precious implant was working correctly. And doesn't Dr. Zhao do the testing? She scoffed. I designed the damn receivers. I can handle the damn machine. She moved over to the cart and swiveled it around. This had been the very first time that I had seen the screen attached to the machine that could apparently read my thoughts. It was underwhelming when I only saw the normal desktop of a Windows computer. As she clicked a couple of icons that were unrecognizable and a screen popped up. And the closest thing that I could compare it to would be an audio editing program. We're going to start the test with a simple association game. I'm going to say a word and you don't have to do anything except think about saying something. Sounds good? Sure, I guess. She clicked a couple of buttons on the large machine the computer was connected to. A couple of lights blinked on and the humming that I was somehow getting used to as well. And she started to speak. Father. Asshole. My father is an asshole. Asshole. A computerized voice said from the speaker attached to the machine. It was just as unsettling as before to hear my thoughts come out of a speaker. How did it know what to speak and what not to? How did it pick just the word asshole from what I was thinking? Job, the doctor said. I was a delivery driver for a pizza place. My job doesn't matter. Pointless, the speaker said to the doctor. I hadn't actually thought that word. At least I thought that I hadn't thought it. What is it about thinking about thoughts that make you think in circles? Circles. Thoughts and thoughts about circles. Circular. Shapes. Things. A bright light and a loud sound and Dr. Brown's face was in front of mine. She was shining the light in my face. Good. You're back in the land of the living. I was dead? I asked in a fog. No, of course not. Now if you can follow the light. It seemed worthy and Dr. Brown put the light in her pocket. She waved the uh, light in front of his face and did the best that I could track it. Volume. It seemed to have stopped for now, but I think we are done with testing for today. She walked over to the machine, flipped a couple of switches, pressed a couple of buttons, and the hum disappeared. There was something odd there, but I couldn't tell what it was. There was something that I was missing. And the doctor continued. And considering the continuous problems with the implant, I'm going to suggest we keep you here until we can figure out what's going on. Keep me here? If it's okay, I'd really like to go home. I feel like it would help. Dr. Brown looked at me. Any kindness that was present on her face just a few moments ago was long gone. I'm very sorry to do this, Rick. Uh, Richard. But as the head doctor here, I'm enforcing the medical contract that you signed. The technical term is medical quarantine. I looked at her. She was keeping me here. Against my will. I reached for my phone as soon as Dr. Brown had left the room. I thought that if I didn't complain about the mental quarantine that I could call the police and get my ass out of here. No luck of course though. So. Sometime between Dr. Brown coming in and leaving, they had done something to the Wi-Fi and of course I didn't get a signal in the basement. I no longer had communication to the outside world. What the fuck had I gotten myself into? I tried asking the nurse when they came in about the feedback problem that Dr. Brown had mentioned. And just like before, they were courteous but silent on any specifics. And of course, there were the complications from the implant itself. 
Besides the pain and soreness, there were bouts of vertigo followed by that strange circular thinking that had happened during the morning test. The third time it had happened, I came back to consciousness to find the TV on the other side of the wall turned to Fox Business Channel. So not only was I losing time, but I was doing things during the lost time. My biggest question at that point was why I felt the need to watch Fox Business. A thought entered my head. Not something specific, more like a need. A desperate need for stimulation of some type. Even if that stimulation was only the ducted tone of the news anchor blathering on and on about some company or another how it was trading over the past couple of days. Hey. A voice from the doorway said. I looked up to see Dr. Zhao. I'm here to check up on the implant site. Is now a good time? I nodded. I'm not doing much else. Unless you count watching green and red arrows. And Dr. Zhao laughed. Glad to see you're in a good mood. He stepped inside of the room and took out a tiny flashlight the same size as the one Dr. Brown had used earlier. I tried to ignore the pain in my neck and I turned enough to show him. He stuck his head close enough that I could feel his breath on my neck and I heard a small click as the flashlight turned on. Everything's looking good, Daniel. Incision is healing up nice. Let me just fire up the receiver and we'll see if the signal is clear. He moved from the bed towards the machine on the cart. Rick... I said to him, My name is Rick. He stopped in his tracks and he looked at me. He had this look on his face for just a second. A look that told me, along with everything else that had been happening, that something had gone wrong. The look disappeared and the man smiled. Of course. My mind's a bit preoccupied today. He turned on the machine and I could hear the hum again. He started asking the same type of weird questions he had when he put the cap on me during our initial testing. Are you sexually attracted to children? The speaker on the car piped up before I could answer. Of course not, you slant-eyed chink. I audibly gasped. I'm so sorry. Dr. Zhao didn't seem phased. No worries. I'm sure... He raised his voice as if he wanted somebody else to hear that was only said in anger at what Rick is going through. I thought to myself for the umpteenth time about what I have gotten myself into. When all this was over, I was definitely asking for more money. Now, if a train leaves... I blinked. Dr. Zhao wasn't in the room. It had happened again. I lost another chunk of time and the TV was on again. This was getting ridiculous. I picked up my phone from where I'd placed it on the side table next to my bed. If any more of this last time shit was going to happen again, I was going to record it. Thankfully, I already had a voice recording app on my phone, so the next time the doctors came in to do their tests, I was going to be ready. My opportunity came later that day around 7pm. Or was it the next day? Even with my phone clock, it had been hard to keep track whether I'd been there for two days or just one. How are you feeling today, Mr. Pinsky? It was Dr. Brown again. Surreptitiously as possible, I changed the screen on my phone from a game to the voice recorder and I pressed the big red button. Feeling okay. Swelling is going down according to Dr. Zhao. Well, that's good to hear. I heard you've been having more feedback problems. She asked. She had not lost a serious face since she had told me that I was stuck down here. If that's what Dr. Zhao said then, sure. My voice dropped with more venom than I had intended. It was getting harder and harder to hide my annoyance and anger with her. She ignored me and went to the machine. It was still on from the last time Dr. Zhao had been in here, so she just clicked a couple of buttons and started moving the mouse around. I'm going to do a couple more tests to see if... He interrupted her. To see if the receiver is working. I get it, just do what you need to do. I'm not going anywhere. She sighed and her face softened a bit. Rick, this situation isn't ideal for any of us. I know it's a lot to ask, but could you please try not to be... I blinked. The hum of the machine was silent and Dr. Brown was no longer in the room. Reality came crashing back and I reached for my phone on the bedside table. It was 7.47pm and the voice recorder was still running. I stopped the recording at 43 minutes. Hopefully my little trick would help me to understand what was going on. It answered my questions. Too many of them. I skipped the first minute and started playing just as Dr. Brown was saying. 
Uh, you could please try not to be so angry. We will hopefully figure out what's going on soon. The voice that answered her was the computer generated voice and the speaker on the cart. When are you and the goddamn chain doctor going to figure out what the hell's going on? Daniel, good. That means the new algorithm Dr. Zell slapped together is working. Dr. Brown said from the voice recorder. Great. I can speak to you through a goddamn computer whenever I want. When are you going to figure out what the hell went wrong? And give me at very least the time frame of when I can take over my new body. The computer said. The computerized voice continued speaking through the recorder. I pay you a ridiculous amount of money to have this procedure done. And now I don't even have my own disease riddled body to go back to. Daniel. Stop calling me that. It's Mr. Warburton to you. Uh, the name the computerized voice said rang a bell in my head, but I couldn't place it at the moment. Uh, the recording continued. Mr. Warburton, we are doing everything in our power to figure out what's going on. The device is functioning to the specifications it's supposed to, so we know it has something to do with Richard. Uh, that should hopefully give you some amount of comfort, uh, knowing that the device, uh, meaning you, is not being damaged in the process. Dr. Brown continued after being interrupted by the computerized voice. Oh, great. I won't die for the second time anytime soon. You told me the procedure had already been done successfully with your own son, Dr. Brown. Was that a lie as well? Of course not. My son was the one who acquired Richard in the first place, so don't bemerge his name when he can't defend himself. You wouldn't even be speaking through this computer if it wasn't for him. I paused the recording. Dr. Brown's own son had already gone through the procedure. A procedure that could move you into a brand new body against somebody's will. And her son had recruited me for whoever this Daniel was. Harold had recruited me. I had already had my suspicions, of course, but that part of the conversation destroyed any hope of help from the outside world. My best friend was gone and replaced with Dr. Brown's son. He had lied to me for months in order to give this Daniel Warburton a new body. I needed to think about how I could help Harold, if at all possible, and this recording was the best source of information that I had, so I pressed the button to continue playing it. The computerized voice raised a couple of octaves. You also said that I would have access to his memories. I believe you called it the whole kitten caboodle, and I have no access whatsoever. I can't even keep track of the time outside of these conversations when you decide to fire up the machine. Tell me how this existential hell is the second life you promised me. Dr. Brown's voice was calm. Mr. Warburton, you signed the release with the procedure and the risks were clearly explained to you. You knew complications were very possible. Every body is unique to the individual. A unique body chemistry and unique brain chemistry. Our initial test did show him particularly susceptible to the implant. Obviously, there is something we didn't catch in our screening. With the rush we had for you, it was entirely possible to miss something. And the computerized voice was a full shot at this point. He actually carried a tone of anger along with the volume increase. You are the genius doctor who came up with this. I'm sorry that my cancer rushed your work. I paid for you to do your job and I paid extra to rush it. Just get this damn thing figured out so I can get back to work. Something on the TV caught my attention and I paused the recording. A picture of an old, sick-looking man came on the screen followed with breaking news. The head of a large investment banking firm had died. The reason a business channel decided to cover this news was apparent as he was a very big player in the investment world. They called him a visionary for predicting the oncoming rise of cell phones and mobile gaming and investing in a lot of tech industries. They also mentioned a lot of his later investments, since being diagnosed with a particularly untreatable form of cancer, and his large investments in the biomedical industry including investments in a startup in Phoenix called Dynamic Medical Machines. Daniel Warburton, a tech investment giant, died at 83. The Fox News anchor said to the camera, I turned off the TV. I didn't feel like seeing the face of a man I had been sold to as a product. I looked back down at my phone. Still no signal to access the internet. I had no best friend looking for me. And my family didn't care enough about me to know that I was gone. I had the mind of the 1% stuck in my head, looking to take over and a literal team of mad scientists trying to figure out why the brain implant didn't work. What I did have, though, was a recording in my own broken mind. Wait a minute. 
I opened the recording app and I went back about a minute in the recording and I listened to it again. I needed to double check something that Daniel had said. I have no access whatsoever. I can't even keep track of what time it is outside of these conversations when you decide to fire up the machine. The blackouts I've been having aren't just losses in my memory. Daniel can't remember them either. I was, or he was, obviously doing something during the blackouts that neither of us could remember. I didn't have any explanation for it, as I was less versed on whatever was going on than even Daniel. But the only time Daniel could speak to them is when they turned on the machine. And the only time we could even keep track of it was when the machine was on. I looked over at the machine in the corner. It was off. I looked back at the phone in my hand. I had a decision to make right now. I didn't know when Dr. Zhao or Dr. Brown or any of the nurses would show up. If any of them had heard the recording, they'd probably take the phone and the charger it was connected to and I would be shit out of luck. If I decided to turn on the machine and try to talk to Daniel with the information I had, I wouldn't have much time to try and get him to get us out of here. I didn't even know if there was anything I could say to him that would get him to expand his incredible resources to get me out of here. But my circumstances dictated desperation. So the real question I had to ask myself was, can I threaten a ghost with death? A knock at the door. Hey buddy, how's it going? Harold, or at least it was Harold's body and Harold's voice and Harold's hair. It was even Harold's smile. But I do remember that it wasn't Harold in there. It could be better, honestly. I keep having these blackouts and they can't figure out what the hell is going on. I stop for a second, suddenly thinking of an idea. I don't think Dr. Brown knows exactly what she's doing. I looked closely at Harold when he had mentioned Dr. Brown. There was the slightest hint of annoyance before the smile returned. If I hadn't been paying close attention, I probably would have missed it. And that did it. The very last hope that Harold was anywhere in there was finally gone. I'm sure they're doing everything they can, man. She was always super nice when I was here. If there's something wrong, I'm sure they'll figure it out soon. And Dr. Brown's son, or Harold, said, Now that I knew the truth, every second I talked to him was torture. Every second this thing pretended to be my friend. Every single second it fouled through my friend's memories and did its best to pretend to be my best friend. Do you think they have any cameras in here or anything? I asked him. Huh? In the room here. Do you think they put any cameras or have any mics in here or anything? He looked around, doing a pretty good impression of someone who was unfamiliar with where he was. I don't see any, but I'd be surprised if this place didn't have cameras up the wazoo. Why do you ask, man? I thought for a second. I really needed him close enough to whisper something that a camera wouldn't pick up. I was wondering something about, you know. I made a quick mime of hitting a joint with my fingers. He laughed. Dude, they did a drug test. They know more about you than you do. Shit, man, I'm sure they do. I just need to ask you something and I don't want the camera to pick it up. He sighed. Fine, dude, but I don't see what the big fuss is all about. He stepped closer to the bed and he put his ear close to my head. I turned in and I covered my mouth to whisper in his ear. Don't let them know, bud. I know who you are. When I move my head back and stop whispering, you're gonna make some excuse to leave and if you let your mother or anybody else know that I know who you are, then the second I get a chance, I'm gonna rip this implant out of my neck and your mother's precious project will lose all of its funding. Got it? I pulled my mouth from his ear and I looked at him. He turned his head slightly and I could see the staring eyes of somebody who definitely wasn't Harold. I didn't know if he would take the threat of ripping out the implant seriously, but at this point, I could only hope that he would. I didn't know if he would even do what I said. Sure, dude, he said in Harold's voice. But I could see behind the eyes now. There was nothing of my friend. And memories and mannerisms, yes, but nothing of my actual friend. So, yeah, I was hoping you could grab that stuff in my apartment. That sound cool, man? I asked him. Yeah, sure, sure. Anything else I could grab for you while I'm there? I thought for a second. A pair of pants, maybe? They haven't given me back the pair I had when I came in here, and it gets a bit drafty sometimes. He stared. Of course, uh, should I go now? 
I nodded. Yeah, it's getting weird not wearing pants in front of other people. Harold laughed. But of course he wasn't Harold. I had to make sure to remember that. However, I had managed to do it, and Dr. Brown's son was listening to me for now, and I needed to do something with that. Maybe Daniel could help me out. I stared at the machine in the corner of the room. How was I supposed to talk to Daniel without going into whatever blackout they put me into? I thought back to the experiments they had performed on me so far. They had done something on the computer and turned on the receiver somehow. And then of course, everything went black and I couldn't remember anything. Except... Except I didn't black out every single time. And there were the tests at the beginning when the speaker just shouted out what I was thinking. Not exactly what I was thinking, but just a general idea of what I was thinking. That could have been Daniel. Or at least the piece of Daniel that was coherent enough to speak and interpret my thoughts. Just a day ago, I was wondering how to spend my money and now I have to figure out how to work a goddamn mind reading machine. Or maybe it was two days ago. It was hard to keep track when there was no sunlight and blacking out every 30 seconds. I grabbed my phone from the side table. 10.07 p.m. And the nurses had already brought dinner and unless I summoned them for some reason, they had no reason to come up. Dr. Brown had never shown up later than 7 p.m. And I'd only ever seen Dr. Zhao once since coming down here. Fuck it. I got up out of bed and I tried to stand up. I was dizzy for a moment as the blood rushed from my head to the rest of my body. I had to grab the bed and steady myself for a moment before I could finally hold myself up. After another minute, the dizziness stopped and I was able to stand on my own. The machine stood in the corner of the room. I had seen Dr. Brown turn on the machine more than once, so I flipped through the switches I remembered her flipping and I started up the screen. The machine turned on and began humming in that all too familiar way. The screen showed a couple of different programs on the screen and, unfortunately, I had no idea which one of the programs Dr. Brown had opened to allow Daniel to be heard through the speaker. I didn't know what to do, so I just decided to try each one. I had a bit of time for trial and error, so I opened the first program that was listed. And for once in my life, I had a bit of luck on my side and the audio editing looking program opened on the first try. I tried clicking around the program looking at the drop down menus, having no idea what anything did before I saw a recently opened section with a list of two different files. One of the files was a random looking string of numbers and letters, but the other was clearly named Daniel. Wow, well, that was pretty damn convenient. I opened up the Daniel file and the various lines of the screen began to move and the hum of the machine got louder. The speaker crackled alive. Is that you again, Dr. Brown? He was there. The man who paid a lot of money to steal my body, my life, and my youth was speaking to me right now. Neither of us were in a good position. Both of us were stuck down here with a malfunctioning piece of machinery, and nobody could figure out what the hell was going on. Both of us were in trouble as long as we stayed here. Mr. Warburton, we have a lot to talk about. Who is this? I swear if it's that goddamn... I'm not Dr. Zhao. My name is Richard Pinsky. I interrupted the speaker. He paused for a second before asking. Who? I sighed in annoyance. Of course he wouldn't even think of me as a person. I was just an empty body for him to inhabit. My name is Richard, and Dr. Brown mentioned me in the previous conversations, I believe. I said confidently. The speaker didn't respond. I sighed again. I'm the goddamn meat suit you paid Dr. Roberts a ridiculous sum of money to buy. Oh, yes, what can I do for you? The speaker said amicably. This didn't make any sense. Where was the asshole I heard in the recording that yelled every other sentence? Mr. Warburton, I'm not going to sugarcoat the situation. Both of us are in a lot of trouble. The implant is malfunctioning for whatever reason and I keep having blackouts. Look, child. I simply don't care what's going on with you. You obviously went through a lot of trouble to turn on this machine and talk to me. Tell me why I should listen to you. The speaker spoke the ultimatum. What could I say to convince him to help me? The titan of industry who controlled the fate of the tech industry for nearly his entire life. A multi-millionaire who sounded like he had funded the entire project in order to cheat death. 
Hell, he had already died. Correction, he was dead to the outside world. And if he was dead to the outside world and still wanted to control his empire, then the ownership of said empire would have to be transferred from him to me somehow. And so I bluffed him. I know about the will. I said. The speaker stayed silent. It hadn't worked. My last chance to get out of this hellhole had just passed and I fucked it up like I fuck everything up. I was going to be chained to this bed the second Dr. Brown and Dr. Zhao came back and talked to Daniel. There wasn't anything that I could do. You have some balls, kid. The speaker said suddenly. And you would have to be me by mine if I, well, had any. But the will means nothing once they fix the implant. He was listening to me. And maybe if I gave him some more reasons to think that he wouldn't make it out of here. And then he could use the full force of his lawyers and his money to get me the hell out of here. To get us out of here, really. And I was pretty sure I had something that would convince him. You aren't dumb, Daniel. The implant is obviously faulty otherwise. You would obviously be in control of my body and I wouldn't even know that anything was going on. I don't even know how long I've been down here because of the amount of blackouts I've had. And they're only getting worse. But Dr. Brown... I interrupted Daniel. And Dr. Brown and Dr. Zhao are only two doctors. If we left here, we could have a full team of doctors figuring out what the hell was going on. The implant is faulty and do you want to take the chance that it'll break and kill both of us? And the speaker was silent. I had taken a big chance coming on as strong as I did. I could only hope that he would listen to me and believe me about the blackouts, even if it was a bit of an exaggeration. Unfortunately, you're probably right. He finally admitted. Do you have a phone? I do, but they've done something and I can't get a call out. I think I have someone who could help me though. I was surprised that I could sleep considering how nervous I was to see a couple of hours, in fact, so I was plenty rested up when I heard a knock on my door. It was Dr. Brown's son in the guise of Harold. He was carrying a pair of my jeans that he promptly threw on the bed. You're an idiot, man. He said to me with no pretense of pretending to be Harold. I paused. Excuse me. But you're a lucky idiot. My mother doesn't arrive at the lab for another hour and Dr. Zhao is taking a nap in his lab. If I wasn't on the cameras most of the time, they would have seen you talking to Daniel. I looked down at the pair of jeans he had thrown on the bed. Why are you helping me? Why did you even listen to me when I let you know I knew who you were? He sighed in a way that I never heard Harold sigh and spoke to me in a cadence and tone Harold never had. I heard the anger in your voice, and my mom took your best friend away from you. He paused for a second and then asked, do you know what the implant does? I started putting the pants on he had thrown on the bed. Besides pull some evasion of the body center shed. He laughed. It bothered me because it reminded me of Harold's easy laugh and smile. It holds a person's consciousness. Or it's a copy. I'm not 100% sure on that point. It's not something that I want to think about. But if someone implanted it into a body and hooked it into their brain, what's already there doesn't go away. I still have access to Harold's memories and what he knows. If you're trying to make me feel sympathetic, it's not working. I interrupted. Of course not. That's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to let you know that I know what Harold thought of you. How he thought of you. All the good memories of you he had and how much of a friend you were to him. You don't deserve this crap and Harold doesn't deserve it either. You don't have to worry about calling Daniel's lawyers because I already did. I stopped putting on my pants and I looked at him. What? I already called his lawyers. They should be here any minute so you could probably finish putting your pants on. He pointed at the pants that were still only halfway on. I laughed. I probably shouldn't meet my new lawyer without pants. The lawyers came in with a pair of cops about 30 minutes later. Dr. Zhao didn't make much of a fuss when confronted with an injunction demanding the release of one Mr. Richard Pinsky for a federal judge. Without Dr. Brown at the building, everybody backed down to the force of lawsuits and kidnapping accusations. I'm in a real hospital this time. The nurses are nice and very specific when answering my questions. The doctors can't make heads or tails of the implant in my neck, but they're hopeful of the specialists that Daniel's money is flying into the premium hotel suite of a hospital room. I told them what I knew about the implant, and while they didn't believe me, they did listen to the recording on my phone. 
That plus, a couple of core document statements from people who worked in the dynamic medical machines building seemed to convince Emma. I still have blackouts. They aren't getting worse, but they're definitely not getting better. Daniel is still here. I was right about the will leaving me for most of his fortune. And there were rumblings from a distant relative, but Daniel assured me. Through the machine that sat consistently in the room on my request, that will was ironclad. Which was unfortunate for him, as he was legally dead. Although he seemed pretty content for now taking care of his money and watching Fox News. Tim, Dr. Brown's son had visited the hospital once or twice to check on me. I can't really blame him for what his mother did to him, implanting him against his will into my best friend. I mean, yeah. I mean, he could have just not recruited me and gotten me into this situation, but I feel bad for him. He volunteered to have his implant removed, but the doctors took one look at his x-ray and said it would kill him. So nothing is too bad now as I lay in this hospital bed and write this down. They're going to bring me in for some type of surgery tomorrow. I don't know if it's the same surgery that would have killed Tim, but it's hard to pay attention sometimes. I trust him because they are the ones without implants in their heads. The ones without heads. Implants without one. Heads without implants. Implants without heads.